Thank you for joining me. Having Ed uh, kind of welcome me here is like having a friend dig your grave for you, but um, this will be fun. So I'm not really going to talk about data. Data isn't really what I work around, but I work around how you apply data to the real world. Um, as he described, I've kind of worked around web startups and um, also physical companies and companies that make physical things. I used to run a design studio called Tinker London, and now I'm the founder of Goodnight Lamp. I will talk a little bit about it, but I won't talk a lot about that. What I will talk about is three things. One which is homes, the other one which is kind of things in the marketplaces they exist in and what's happening right now, and the future. So my only reference to history really is a visual one. So homes. Um, when people talk about data and big data, I always think of three things, which is either smart cities or kind of quantified self, so when you kind of track things that are happening to you, and also smart homes. And smart homes is an area I've been interested in working around for many years now. And it's a super tricky area, but I think it's also super meaty. Um, because when I look at how much money I spend on a, week, you know, on a monthly basis as a consumer, not as a designer, um, smart cities for me might mean what my council can do with my council taxes. So put some sensors in the local garbage trucks and get a sense that you know, garbage is flowing around my council. Uh, but there's not a lot that I can contribute to that in terms of money. Um, quantified self, well, I know that people are interested in my data for insurance purposes, for example. Um, so, you know, the medication I'm taking, how much I'm exercising, that might modulate how much someone might charge me for an insurance policy. And really, maybe I don't want to let them know. And how much I spend on medication in this country, especially I've been here for five years, is very little. So, really, the bulk of my spending is things that end up in my home. You know, even my clothes end up in my home in my wardrobe. Um, the objects that I have, the devices that I have, all end up at home. And of course, I pay rent, which is, you know, upwards of 40% of your income. So there's a lot of money there, and there's a lot of companies there, and there's a lot of interest there. And the internet is kind of knocking on the door of everybody's homes, going, interested? And everybody's homes are very, very different. Everybody's environment is entirely unique. Our home is our identity. We shape our homes like we kind of shape ourselves. We decorate it with things that we think are important. We put devices in that we think are interesting. Um, but, you know, very little else right now. And there are companies that are, you know, trying to sell us these ideas around what we should be putting in our home. This is an awesome blog. If you're bored right now, you can always look at that. Um, and you know, the idea of an internet fridge is uh, an idea that now, for about 12 years, people have been pushing in our faces. Uh, and no, you know, no one's interested, but everybody's looking at it going, well, okay, you know, I could see what you're trying to do, but right now it doesn't really work. Um, and eventually someone comes out with something in the market that isn't the internet fridge, but is a magnet. And when you push the little button on the magnet that sits on your fridge, you order water bottles. And people think, oh yeah, that's much better, because they've been told about the internet fridge for so long that this seems like a more viable option. And this actually exists, this is a French product. Um, so people are in the long game, and you know, people who make white goods and who make our fridges and our dishwashers, etc. there are companies that have been started 50 years ago and that will still be here in 50 years. So they have an interest in bringing the internet to our home because they know that eventually we break down and buy the internet fridge. Televisions are also really interesting. Right now, um, 2010, there were a million internet-connected televisions sold on the market, um, but no one quite knows if anybody did connect them to the internet, which is interesting because eventually someone, you know, Hitachi, whoever, will come out with a fantastic user experience and fantastic on-screen experience, and everybody will go, wait a minute, is my television internet-connected? And they'll look at the back and they'll go, oh yeah. They hadn't noticed it was there. They just bought a TV. And so the functionality is kind of slowly seeping into our homes. Um, the ability to make something out of that data, make it interesting. So when people talk about the Internet of Things, what they often mean is you know, the Internet of Devices. Um, and with this lens of thinking about the home, you could claim 
you know, rather stupidly, that uh, a mobile phone is just a handheld way to figure out if there's any milk left. Um, and a laptop is a kind of desktop or laptop way to figure out if there's any, desk, uh, any milk left. Uh, our connections to each other are incredibly rich, to our information, to our data and our um, files and our work are incredibly rich, but we're still kind of knocking at the door of the home going, okay, well, can you give me anything, tell me any information? Um, and, you know, essentially since the 1960s, our homes aren't very different. Um, okay, flatter TV, bigger TV, more consoles, but essentially, you know, we're still buying furniture, we're still laying out the furniture in about the same way, we're still living and, you know, laying out our worlds in the same way. Until a few years ago. Um, who here knows what this is? Recognizes this? Vaguely? Okay. Um, this is an Arduino. If you do not know what this is, please Google it now. I don't care what you do in life, this is important. Um, Arduino.cc. This is an open source hardware platform that emerged in about um, 2005, I guess. I was a student in the master's degree where this was being developed. And this has really changed how people understood what they could do and how they could be designers and how they could make things. So people started making all sorts of things. Um, and things that went into people's homes because they were at home, it was the weekend, they had some time, and they were just kind of tinkering. This is quite old now, but it's one of my favorites. It's called Botanicals, which is a little humidity sensor that you stick in your plants, and whenever your plants are um, out of water, it either sends you a text message or a tweet. Um, and this has now been cloned however many times. It's an open source project, and now people have these things on the marketplace. Uh, if you go to CBIT in Hanover every year, they'll have a new one out by some company. But this was the original one. Um, and the home is starting to evolve into this place where there are things that start to look like technology and, you know, kind of devices, but not quite because there's still thermostats. Um, I'm sure you've heard of this. This is called Nest. It's from um, some of the guys that used to work at Apple, and it's a smart thermostat. So it kind of sees when things are happening in your home. There's a little motion sensor, and then it adapts the temperature according to how many people might be in the home. This is an old one as well, um, but I think also uh, kind of old things are also very useful. This carrots, it used to be called an Abbas tag, and it's an internet connected rabbit. Uh, its ears move and it connects to other rabbits and data on the cloud, and it, you, know, you can get it to say Carl Sagan quotes, which I think is quite nice. Um, but this, this idea that the internet exists in a thing that is rabbit shaped is completely ludicrous, but also makes complete sense, because why not, right? This costs now about 70 pounds, you can buy it now. If you were at the Internet of Things showcase yesterday in the main hall, um, you would have seen Hinsights. And Hinsights is one of the things I'll talk about in terms of the things that are emerging now, which is small companies, small experiments, people looking for money, people looking for tooling and looking for expertise, who are slowly starting to build these things that we want in our homes. Um, and they're not big companies, and they have almost no support, but they're really interesting. These are a series of displays that kind of remind you of things that you want to be reminded about. And the point is they're not square. It's not a huge screen. It's a cute screen. It's a thing you actually want in your home, potentially. This was also there um, yesterday. I think John's here somewhere. Um, this is called the wear dial, which is uh, a reference to Harry Potter. So whenever a member of your family is kind of around, then the dial will turn to show where that person is. Just so you can kind of keep an eye on people and see you know, what people are up to. And he's making this and he's selling this right now. And uh, this is you know, laser cut in his studio in Liverpool, which is amazing. Buy one now. Uh, and this you might have also heard about. This is called Little Printer from the lovely guys at Berg. And this is a tiny thermal printer that you stick on a table somewhere and it just prints things out at whatever time you want them to be printed out. So let's say you want you know, the weather every morning at 7 a.m. to be printed out. Or you want a friend to be able to send you jokes every day. So you stick it on your desk. And so it's not a printer printer. It's a connected, internet connected thermal printer, which um, is confusing, but also full of potential, because you can go, oh, 
oh, I see what they're trying to do. I see what I could design or the type of content that I would like to see in tiny receipt form, which is not something that you know, Bosch will ever come up with um, or Hitachi will ever come up with. It. it comes from very, very small businesses that are used to dealing with the internet but also want to start making things. This is a, a business in San Francisco called Green Goose and they've just started releasing these kits where you attach a little sensor to a toothbrush and it goes with a iPhone game and when the kids are kind of you know, not brushing their teeth and you give them this and keep them entertained so the little character um, changes according to how much they brush their teeth and so there's a two minute, you, know, you have to brush your teeth for two minutes so the little character does things for two minutes and keeps kids entertained and this is now being sold and this is, you know, this is starting to be the future, this is the future now. This is what I'm working on, which is called the Goodnight Lamp, and this is about trying to figure out what it means to have a physical social network. If I had a lamp for every one of my friends, and whenever they turned their lamp on, I could see that they were on, and they were at home or at the office, wherever they were. What would that mean? How would I consider other devices and other things around me? What's the usefulness of that versus my cell phone versus AIM versus Twitter? Um, trying to design a language around things that I have around me that had no meaning before, but then suddenly start to have meaning. So this is all super massively exciting, oh my god, oh my god, and um, there's a lot of people looking at this going, this is interesting, this is still quite small, and we quite like data. So they're building businesses around data, so connecting the Internet of Things, providing software infrastructures where if you make a thing with an Arduino, uh, then you've got a place where you can keep that data, keep it safe, manage it, uh, publish it, share it, etc. And there are upwards of 15 to 20 of those businesses right now, um, and I think that they're super important. But I also think that without the things, the data is kind of meaningless in this world, where you can have an infrastructure for the data, but if you don't have the things at the end of it, then you know, it's, it's a software project. It's not an Internet of Things project. So the future. Um, super messy, massively messy. Kickstarter is full of absolutely fantastic little ideas and little products and little companies trying to get money, trying to make it happen, and also, um, you know, not doing anything with the money, not updating anybody, and then Kickstarter is now starting to react to that. If you don't look at Kickstarter for kind of sources of innovation, please do. It's really, really fascinating. This is a fantastic blog post they posted about two weeks ago saying, hey, you know what, Kickstarter is not a store, and if you're gonna put a project up there and you're a person making a thing, you actually have to be serious about making the thing. You have to keep people updated and you have to be incredibly realistic about the challenges and suddenly starting to ask for details that look a lot like a business model and a business plan. Whereas, you know, that wasn't really what they were aiming for. That wasn't really how people were perceiving Kickstarter in the first place. But this is happening because making things is hard and making things is expensive and it takes a lot of expertise. And, you know, the future is also super messy because the high street is kind of disappearing. So if you do make things, where are you going to sell them? Where are you going to put them in front of people? Um, you know, John Lewis does not have an Internet of Things section, um, at least not yet. And companies and digital companies are starting to have brick and mortar presence. If you imagine the crisis that the high street is in now, it's going to be massively exciting in five years where you'll have a Google store next to an Amazon store next to a Groupon store. Um, this is one of their uh, showcase stores in Singapore, for example. And things just take time. Things take time to become part of everybody's lives. Um, and this is something that is incredibly important. Um, good example I found is the microwave, because you could sort of claim that the microwave is the latest high-tech thing to get into your homes. And actually, the first patent was filed in 1945. And it took until the 90s before everybody, or nearly everybody, had them in their homes. That's a long time. It's a long time for uh, a world of startups right now where everybody's kind of, you know, if you're not selling within two years, you're just not cool. Um, these are companies that actually want to be there for the long run, and you have to want to be there and want to 
really become part of people's lives so that if someone wants to get into the microwave business now, then they know there's a marketplace. Whereas all those little companies that I described, there's you know, no real marketplace right now. It's kind of, oh, you know, how do you know people will want a small thermal printer? How do you know people will want connected lights? Where's your marketplace? I'm inventing it. Um, and that's also massively exciting. So if it took 40 years to get TV dinners to your home and for it to just become a reality, um, how many years is it going to take until you buy an internet connected broom? Because it'll be cheap and it'll be just you know, a no brainer because then you can accuse your spouse of not doing enough you know, washing or whatever. Because everybody wants that, right? Um, I hope this has been interesting. I think. Um, the, you know, the power of data is what you do with it in the physical world. And certainly, there's so much going on, there's so much entrepreneurship, there are so many startups, both here and in the States, that um, really it's worth getting involved. So I hope you'll join me, and please ask me any questions on Twitter. Thank you.